walked on up to the house, and I looked, and it was very bizarre. I mean, who knows what a dead house looks like? Well, this was a dead house. I called my landlord, and he said, it's just all gone. Everything is just completely gone. There's nothing left. And I just wailed. Oddly enough, the only thing. My van. The van. My doggy van. Shawnee's van with all the paint thinners and paint in it. It was the only thing we didn't take. We left it there, you know. We needed to get the dogs out safe. And when we got back, it was the only thing. Surviving <laughs> fire is a lot. It's selective, yes. But I would also have to say, it knows what it's doing. And it's so ferociously undeniable, and it's freaking awesome in its completion of the thing. You really have to respect it in the end. It's an experience you don't forget. I had dreams about it for months after, and there'd just be this inferno. It just came up, and the smell of it would stay smoldering. The things that you had stood upon and had built your life upon, in a way, are completely gone. And you're sitting there thinking, well, this is interesting. So who am I really then? Awesome. Some of the most awesome, powerful stuff I've ever seen. Big, black, billowing smoke and the full moon. Absolute hell. Almost anybody you know who's had any length of time here in Santa Barbara has had some experience with fire. Losing homes, losing friends' homes, you know, whatever it might be. Almost everyone I know, back to the Coyote fires and the Sycamore Canyon fire, all the big fires, you almost can't meet someone who hasn't been affected in a traumatic way, in a deep way. I came out of Los Angeles in Orange County. I had worked in radio. Back then, there was a news department for almost every radio station. Eventually, I got hired in Santa Barbara. So I'm 24 years old, and I'm the news director of KTMS Radio 1250. 1981, October. And it was a very legendary radio station. I hadn't realized the real KNX-type texture it had up here. By that meaning, it was an award-winning station. It had roots that went back to the 30s. And in short order, people would tell me about all these great news events. And there were probably two that they talked about the most. Uh, one was the shootout at Bryant and Sons Jewelers on State Street, which has nothing to do with what we're going to be talking about. It, it was a talk of the town type thing. And the Sycamore Canyon fire, which was July 27th of 1977. I was 23. I was working and doing carpentry and stuff like that. I had a little house on Mountain Drive, and I lived with my girlfriend, Tessa, who I adore. Always liked Tessa. Love my life. Nice live-in situation. When I moved here, it was in 1972. My son was just little, not quite a year old. My grandmother lived here. We'd all migrated here. And it was a place where my ex-husband could serve. I don't think I've ever lived in a better place than this. It's wonderful, the climate, the people. Everything is perfect. My first impressions of Santa Barbara? Absolute heaven. Especially since coming from a busy city in New Jersey, a busy, ugly city. It was heaven. Heaven. And I was working on the Riviera, so what could be nicer? I'm a hiker, and I love going in the mountains and finding all the back trails. And it was a community. It always felt from the very beginning like, like a welcoming community, one that you felt a part of almost immediately. I was nine months old when my family moved here, so I consider myself a native. My father had a job here at Biltmore, and I've lived in Montecito my whole life. I went to Montecito Union, Carpinteria High School. I went right here to Santa Barbara City College, graduated, and went to UCSB. I was at UCSB studying shamans as a graduate student in religious studies, and I think I was always feeling a bit like an outsider, <laughs> because, well, I am, right? <laughs> I think we all are, even though we may have grown up here. I lived here six years, Santa Barbara is a nice city. Surrounding areas, the mountains, the ocean. It's really beautiful. Oh, it's a beautiful place. The landscape, the light. Now that's something I've often heard a lot of people talk about. There is a, a certain quality of light here. And I think that's very true. We met a long time ago in London. 
We were hippies. <laughs> they hitchhiked through Morocco and Spain and all that. And we fell in love and we got married and moved to Isla Vista. <laughs> Never even saw the inside of the apartment we rented. That was 36 years ago and we're still here. Oh, Maureen wanted to go back to Los Angeles. <clears throat> Movie industry and production and stuff. <laughs> but I kept me to well, a Well, he did drive. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and L.A., well... L.A. was overwhelming for him, which is why we sort of came to Santa Barbara, because I could go to UCSB, and it was a lot less overwhelming as far as the city goes. And it was so beautiful, we didn't leave. Yeah. <laughs> and now Maureen hates going back down there, but down to L.A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I can avoid it, I do. September of 1959, my, my dad dropped me off in front of the old Carrillo Hotel with a couple of suitcases, turned around and left me. He said, you're going to college tomorrow, so I took a bus out to UCSB, and Moved in Anna Anna Kappa Hall. And then I left in 1966 and went off to medical school. And after 10 years of training, I was very, very lucky to come back working for a local medical clinic. I still work for that local medical clinic 35 years later. My mother started bringing me up here when I was very young, just a child. I have some old memories of digging for shells by the pier. So I've been coming up here off and on my whole life. Our really good friends from Canada came down when we first moved in. We went for a walk on the beach at Isla Vista. Oh, what a funny thing. Uh, and not long after that, uh, you know, the June gloom and all was all that we knew. So Maureen and I went for a walk on the bluffs. Uh, what's the name? Del Playa. Uh, Del Playa. Uh, you know, it was the first clear day in about a month since we moved here. Uh, and we saw these land masses, and I said to myself, what is that, Ventura or something? And, uh, and a friend said, that's the Channel Islands, man. Where you been? Yeah. <laughs> As an arts community, it almost immediately had something to offer. There is a, a, a liveliness here and, and a feeling about it that you can be creative in a lot of different ways and not be lost in it. But as a young adult on my own, I came up when I was 18 or 19, and I just fell in love with everything up here. Being able to get to beautiful sort of rugged, wildish beaches, into the mountains, and just the lushness, the very unique geographical layout that I find in Santa Barbara. I love it. My existence in Santa Barbara? It all started as part of wanting to become a firefighter. I had the opportunity to come to Santa Barbara with a friend of mine when I was taking the firefighter's exam. I got married here. We bought an acre in Montecito and built a house. But my real connection probably is through horses. When I was a little kid, I just loved horses. The first thing out of my mouth, I think, was horse. I wanted a horse more than anything else. And when I was eight years old, my mother said to me, well, if you save the money by the time you're 10, We'll buy a horse. Looking back on it, uh, there was a time when I thought I might go back to L.A. Initially because my family and friends were down there, and because there's the opportunity to make a little more money than you can up here. I think most everybody that lives in Santa Barbara sacrifices a little bit of pay for the ambiance and the small town feel. And so yeah, that's sort of what took hold for me. And After a year or two, it was at that point that I didn't see myself going back. So I did. I saved $150 by the time I was 10 years old. And so that was the beginning of my involvement with horses, and I still have them and love them. There's something about horses. People think they're not very smart, but they are very smart. They know exactly what's going on. So, in 69, we moved into that house on Mount Calvary, and we were evacuated many times. In fact, once we were in Canada, and the fire burned all the way up to the house, including the bank. We lived right above Gibraltar, so it burned all the way up, including the garden furniture. But it didn't touch the house. We had a little redwood house. Horses are intuitive, and I think that's what's so interesting to me about them. They really do understand exactly what you're feeling. After the Painted Cave Fire in 1991, when 35 horses were lost, I became involved and I helped found our Santa Barbara Equine Rescue and Evacuation Team. We moved in in 1977 after living in a couple of other houses before we found the one we wanted. And I knew it was going to burn down. It's part of my personality, I think. Well, part of being a dog. Is you tend to look at what could happen here and, you know, how can I stay one step ahead of the curve when you're taking care of patients, obviously. 
and it's a personality trait, I'm afraid, sometimes to my detriment. We looked at the house and bought the house. It was right on the edge of the canyon, back into Tucker's Grove, maybe a half a mile from Cathedral Oaks. Tucker's Grove is beautiful. Oak trees, chaparral, poison oak. And we were right on the edge of the canyon. I moved in on a Saturday, and the fire happened on Thursday. East Mountain Drive was an area that, as an artist and meditator and spiritualist, I always thought would be fabulous to live in that community. So I kind of wrangled my way in there, insisting that I needed to be there, and absolutely certain that it was imperative that I move in there. So we went through many, many fires. One time, we woke up, and it was burning right next to the house. And my ex-husband said, we can't evacuate. I can't get up now. I have a lecture to give tomorrow. <laughs> so I said, well, you don't have to get up. I'm going. So I put the cat in the car and off we went. Of course we went. And it didn't burn down. Nothing burned on that road. That was amazing. So that day, a beautiful, gorgeous, sunny, fabulous day, I woke up and I decided that I needed to go for a walk because I hadn't walked the land up there since I'd moved in. So I went for an early morning walk and was just walking on Mountain Drive all the way down to Coyote. I don't remember much of the day. I, I think I worked. I don't remember there being any big wind that day. It was a beautiful day in Santa Barbara. Good sunrise day, good sunset day. I knew enough about wildfire behavior. I looked around and I thought, this place hasn't burned in a long time, and, and this place could burn down. Nevertheless, it had a beautiful view of Lacumbra Peak, a beautiful cathedral ceiling looking up to the northeast right at Lacumbra Peak. There was even one point uh, five or six years after we moved in when I thought, wouldn't it be cool to put a TV camera on the roof? And you could pan and tilt and, and zoom the camera, and look at the camera at night on a monitor in the house. And, and if a hot spot showed up, you and your friends could probably build some sort of a circuit with an alarm that said, there's a lot of infrared coming from the canyon right now, and why don't you get out of bed and go take a look? That's, that's how much I thought about it. I remember that Tessa and I had a little argument. She said, get out of here. Go fly your kite. I built this box kite. It was a, it was a box kite that I made for a kite flying contest down at Ledbetter Beach. It's a beautiful little box kite. It's a great kite because it flies pretty much straight up. And the idea was that someday, because I really liked that kite, I was going to go for the altitude record. But I put that idea away. And I was absorbing everything. And I absolutely felt compelled to take this walk and linger over it. And I absolutely didn't understand why. So I went out on the deck. We lived in this little saddle. And I had the kite up probably 100 feet up through some eucalyptus trees. And the wind started to pick up a little bit. Well, it was enough to hold the kite up there, and it started to tug a little bit. I just went with the flow and looking at houses and just taking in everything. I had finished up at my office. My son was in town working at a local pharmacy for the summer. Wife and daughter were on their way to Los Angeles. It was a very, very hot day. And it was, I was thinking, the worst Santa Ana I had ever seen in Santa Barbara during the day, starting out at noon, 1 o'clock. Very, very hot. Upper 90s, extremely low humidity. Wind coming down the mountain absolutely fiercely, 40 miles an hour, something like that. I got into the house and it was just extremely hot. The wind started to pick up and the reel wasn't unrolling. It had gotten knotted up in the reel and it hit my finger and just popped out of my hand. And the reel is dragging along the road the way a dog would drag a leash. So I jumped down on the ground barefoot and I'm chasing after my reel up the hill and it gets stuck in a yucca. And those tiny things that fall from the yucca are getting stuck in my feet. And it's like, oh, man. And so I come up to the reel, and it, it just unwinds, and then it goes. On my way back, I look up, and I see the three arches of the tea garden, which I'd never heard of before. And I've lived up here a long time. And I look up, and I thought, well, what the heck is that doing up there? What is that? Huh, I'm going to have to ask somebody. And I stood and I stood for a long time and looked at that. And then I went back to where I was living and started unpacking. The reel hit Mountain Drive. The string gets taut up along the kite, and the reel gets stuck around a telephone line. 
And along Mountain Drive, which I came to find out later, 16,000 volt lines that run along Mountain Drive that feed Westmont College, I come to find out later, are bare copper lines. No insulation around the damn things. I'm unpacking into my closet and I kept hearing this voice. You've got to get out of the house. And I was arguing, going, listen, I don't want to get out of the house. I need to finish this task. You've got to get out. Well, the kite reel is stuck around the lines, and the wind's blowing so hard that the kite is just fluttering back and forth. And the nylon string had already made contact with one of the three lines, and as the kite is just wailing in the wind, it's coming closer and closer to the other two lines. Finally, I said, OK, I give up. You win. I'll get out of the house. Where am I going to go? I'll go to the beach. So I went to Hendry's. It's my favorite place to walk. Anyway, right when the string hit the other line, there was this bright blue flash that went both ways along the lines, about 200 feet each way. It was like the dust in the air or something that caused it. It, it was like this aura. It was, it was actually plasma. And it just rained sparks down on the brush. And I thought, oh, shit. So I go for a walk at the beach. The sun's going down. The sundowner winds came just so hot. Like an Arizona wind. So I ran down the hill back to the house, yelling to Tessa to call the fire department. I'm going down to try to put this fire out. And I've got nothing but boxers on. And I grab a broom. They didn't even have a shovel back then. I grab a broom, and I'm trying to put the fire out. It's the hottest wind I ever remember feeling in Santa Barbara, period. Much less standing on the beach. It was just shocking how hot it was. And the sun was pure red. And I stood there thinking, Oh, this is hell's inferno. That's what I'm going. Please, God, rain or do something. I need help here. I mean, if you've ever been in a place you don't want to be in, something bad is going to happen. I mean, you know things are going to go bad. I knew fires around here. I knew it was bad. I'm looking out across the horizon at the twinkling lights, and one of the lights isn't twinkling normally. And I'm just kind of watching it while leaning against the wall, and I see this sort of finger of light. And sometimes when you see debris all the road, traffic cars along the road can sort of do that. You can see strange things in the night light, and in the wind, everything kind of changes when you look over the horizon and all that. But this wasn't that. This started stretching out and moving. Well, it took forever for the firefighters to get up there. It took nothing at all for it to turn into a fairly decent-sized fire. Now, I remember the truck stopping and the guys jumping out. And this one guy grabbed a hose out of the back of the truck, and he started running over to the hydrant. And I, I grabbed the hose 10 feet behind him and ran ahead of the guy. I mean, I I already get water on the tip. But it was so far away from Kitty Hill over in the hills of Montecito, and I still couldn't figure out what it was I was looking at. And then I finally saw it kind of do that. And I said, holy mackerel. And probably said something else as well. And I was on the phone with a friend of mine, and I said, I think a brush fire is just breaking out in this old hills of Montecito. Hold on. And then I went back into the newsroom, and I said, hey, everybody look out the window. Is that a fire out there? And then the scanner started squawking with all the tone outs from the fire department. A uh, report of a brush fire over the Montecito Hills. And they were giving locations over by Westmont College. And I said, that's it right there. I've been watching it now for a couple of minutes, and I think that's what we're looking at. So I left Hendry's, and just as I was getting to the freeway, turn on K-Tide. We have a report that a fire's just been spotted. It's been going for about 10 minutes. East Mountain, Cold Springs, Coyote. I tend to be a little dramatic, but I don't tend to be a screamer, but I'm in my car. And I just screamed. I could not believe it. I thought, this is so not possible. And who shows up with the thing I was hoping for and praying for? One of those Bore bombers. I mean, what a sight. This guy is coming down the canyon at about 200 knots. And it's a big airplane. This guy can't be more than 20 feet off the ground. And this guy lets loose with that Bore, and it just screamed us. It's like getting hit with jello. And it was the most beautiful sight, watching that thing come down the canyon. We were actually at City College. My husband and I went to the gourmet dining room. We were meeting friends of ours for dinner. And we had just pulled up to campus, and someone said, you know, there's a fire. You can see it. it it's burning in the hills from here. And the fire was out, and that was it. I thought that was it. The day of the tea fire, I was in martial arts class. And I'm not exactly sure what happened. But I remember seeing a lot of smoke coming from the mountains. Everyone just stopped and went to the window, and we were just gazing towards the mountains. So I went over, 
and I saw huge plumes of red and gray everywhere. Well, by the time I get back up to the house, I look down towards Sycamore Canyon, and there's fires down there. And I'm like, what the hell? I mean, what is that all about? I don't know. They'll never know if sparks got down there or what kept it going down the canyon. That evening I was at concert band practice at City College and we were in one of our final rehearsals for a big concert. And somewhere in the middle of rehearsing, the lights went out. And people did not know what to do. So it was kind of dark and completely strange. And, and people were playing a little bit, but eventually it came to an end. And we had this, this awareness that maybe there was something actually wrong. Driving with my father up Haley Street, we saw the fire break out. I guess it was 6.30 or so, and, and I looked up and I saw what I thought was the landmark, a landmark that I think stands out to just about everybody in Santa Barbara. It's that big mansion that sits at the top of Los Alturas that you can see from just about everywhere. And from my perspective, it looked as though that was on fire. And I told my dad, this is going to be big. So I flew up onto the freeway, came around the curve there, and I could see and thought, oh my god, oh my god because it was already enormous. Just enormous within, what, 10, 15 minutes? So now the clock is moving forward. It's now, say, 5 to 6. So we're going to go on and do our newscast at 6 o'clock. And I said, we have got to get this on the air. And everyone knew that. So I called for my cell phone to my new landlord, and I'm babbling hysterically into the phone, where are you? What's happening? And he says, no. I'm downtown, but it's fine. I heard it's over by Los Alturas. Nothing to worry about. He was not concerned at all. And I said, no, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'm on the freeway. I can see it. And I can tell you that if it's not already at the house, it's going to be there immediately. I can see it. And he goes, goodbye. And he didn't hesitate. There was a waft of smoke coming up from the Mission Canyon area that one of the people working on my land, one of my landlords, was making some comments about. So I came out of my cottage to check it out because we're all a little nervous about the fire, you know, because it's been really dry. And my landlord comes running down saying, well, I heard something about it just being a burn-off or some sort of control burn. But that wasn't what his body language was saying. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, something's not right. Something feels really not good. I heard it when it first came on the radio to the Forest Service that there was a smoke plume by Painted Cave. Then another person came back on the radio and said, no, 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 that's the transfer station. And the Forest Service officer reporting and calling it said, no, no, you don't understand. There's a smoke plume on the mountain by Painted Cave. So the communications chief and I went up on the roof of the Forest Service building in Goleta in all that hot, dry wind. And indeed, there was a fire on the mountainside. So we were among the first couple of people to say, my, my God, that looks terrible. I mean, what a bad place today to have a smoke plume. We watched it for about five minutes. It got huge very, very quickly. Jim, my friend, said, you need to go home and you need to get ready to evacuate. We knew exactly what we were looking at. And we looked and we said, that's our house. That's actually right near our house. And our friend said, well, you guys need to leave. You need to get home and see what's going I on. I got my phone. I called my dad and he picked me up. We were just looking at the sky because it was so dim. Did you just look at the sky? Yeah, because it was so dim. It was a really tense atmosphere. Everyone was just sort of intently focused on getting home like I was. I packed up my stuff really quickly and went out to the car, and it struck me. It was really dark, very dark. You know, there was backup power, but it was dim. And you could just see the flames in the hills and the ashes falling everywhere. People were really just freaked out, I think, and people headed for their cars. I was home. I had actually just gotten home, and we had gotten a call. We've been working with the Montecito Fire Department for years. One of our members was a battalion chief there, so we worked very closely and trained with the Montecito Fire Department. And when the tea fire broke out, we were stationed right down there on East Valley Road. So we put a camera out on our TV patio, and we opened the newscast that night with a live shot across the city, zooming in. And what we said essentially was, good evening. Uh, we have a major story unfolding for you this evening. We are seeing a fresh fire breaking out in high winds in the hills of Montecito. And that set the tone for our continuous coverage around the clock for a great deal of time. I think it was two days or something. But this was one of the only and may have been the only document start to semi-finish of a fire, unveiling on live TV in front of the city for hours. So we got in our car and we headed home. 
we knew the back roads. We'd lived there long enough to take the back roads and avoid the heavy traffic. We got through and we came up this, this little road that comes really close to our street. There's this massive traffic jam getting out of City College and everywhere as I was driving downtown trying to get home. I remember I was in the small car in the, in the Miata. It was really low on gas and I was a fairly new driver so I was kind of worried about getting home safely with the conditions as they were. But everyone seemed really civil. Even though all the lights were on, you could, you could see it in people's faces. Everyone was evidently scared. Everyone was scared driving. Cliff Drive was backed up all the way. It was just thanks to folks being nice and letting people merge into that huge line of cars that, that we were able to get off campus safely. I just remember thinking, this is like some kind of apocalypse film with the people cramming to get out and the ash in the air. It was a little scary, but I was concentrated solely on getting home. And we got to our house and we could just see the fire was raging already at that point and, and coming down from the tea garden and you could just see it moving across the valley there, across from us. It was astounding. We couldn't believe that from the time we left City College to the time we got home, that it had already moved so far. And it was clearly out of control already. And we said, oh gosh, what do we do? It was clear to me that the fire had come a couple of miles downhill already, in the time it took me to get from Goleta to within a mile of my house. I passed uh, one of my doctor friends on the way up there, and there was a lot of traffic. We looked at each other, and uh, I went like this, and he went like this, which I took from his gesture to mean that his house had already burned down way up towards San Marcos Pass Road. My partner was at her real estate office. I remember I called her up and said, if you ever believe me, you must believe me now. Get in your car and come back here no matter what anyone says. And so my dad dropped me off, I got my truck, and I headed to Station 3, which is my station over on East Sola Street. And as firefighters, especially ones that live in the community, because not everybody does, you're to report to your station in case of a large emergency. And as firefighters, you want to be where the biggest action is. And so we wanted to get a sign to that fire. And we did. The wind was howling. It was 70 mile an hour winds then. We certainly weren't going to broadcast live from there because we couldn't get a mask up in front like the Pentagon. We wanted to at least get some video before we pulled out and set up a live show. So we drive in, and all the little burning embers from the hills are just coming off of everything and just hitting us and burning branches. And everything's just glowing in the air. There's superheated air, blowing wind, fire trucks are coming in and out. People are telling us, don't go that way. And the wind came through, and it was so windy from the Santa Ana winds. Then there was the wind created by the fire itself. It was so intense that my car was just shaking things up. The, the fire was getting much more intense, and the wind was, I remember the wind was the worst. The wind was, was intense, and th 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 there were embers flying in the wind. It's howling like a train. I mean, you wouldn't be able to hear me. It was that loud. I'd have to yell at the top of my lungs, and you could barely hear me. It was just that loud. Thursday, I, uh, well, <laughs> one of my little antidotes to the whole thing is uh, there was a fire. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, we heard there was a fire, and we turned on key news. Well, before that, was, uh, I had been in L.A. I had been in L.A. all day, and I drove back up around, well, I guess I got back up around 3.30 or 4. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was out with the dogs, and I think it was about 5.30. It started... Were, uh, what time was that, about 4.30 or 5? 6.30. 6.30? Yeah. I thought it was earlier than that. Nope. Uh, like we had KEYT on, uh, and they always give it, uh, they shoot it from their station, you know. So it didn't look like it was coming right down. It looked like it was actually going towards uh, uh, from, more, more coming from uh, Westmont and towards Montecito, uh, just from KEYT. And I flew down the freeway and up Cold Springs. My landlord was coming from downtown and went up Coyote, so we're zipping up, trying to get through to the house. The firefighters had just pulled up when I got, thank God, because I would have gone flying in there. They said, do you have pets? Do you have people? I said, no, I don't. Then just walk away. We're not letting you in. And I said, but I'm in my old flip-flops and old jeans. And they said, is it worth your life because you're going to die if you go in there? And I went, wow, okay. It was the first time in my life I almost felt like I was going to die because 
I felt trapped. There was so much smoke, I could not see. The neighborhood was just a mess. There were people loading stuff into their cars. There was a guy on the, on the roof of his house with a hose saying, I'm never going to leave my house. Because I was involved in emergency communications, and a couple of my neighbors said, what do we do? What do we do? And I said, get out. We got to our house, sort of by the back way, because there were police and firefighters with bullhorns, you know, saying, you got to pack up and get out now. And I, I looked at my husband, and I said, well, what do we do? And he said, we're going to wait. Let's wait. Let's think about what we need to pack. But it's over. It's on the other side. Let's just wait. We need to wait. So we waited. I didn't even look out the window. I was sitting there reading whatever it was I was reading, a newspaper, a book, and my friend calls and said, Joan, do you realize there's a fire right there by your house? I got a little cuckoo that night. I kind of got locked on this. I guess this can happen when people get stressed and you don't really know what to do. But I kept thinking that I somehow still needed to get up there to the house if I could just somehow find the right road to go up. So I looked out the window and you could see the flames. So I called my neighbor. I said, Carol, what's happening? She said, there's a fire. I said, are you getting out? She said, I'm going to wait about an hour. I thought, well, she knows, you know. I mean, she lives right next door, so I waited a while and grabbed a few things. There's a fire coming. You must go. There are fire engines and reverse 911 calls saying the fire marshal says you have to evacuate. And it was like, oh my god. They're saying clear the road. Sheriff saying can't go this way. We're saying we're with the press. And we knew we could go. We'd already seen evacuees coming out. I mean, most of those people are gone because there aren't that <coughs> many houses up there. So we didn't have to worry about evacuees too much. They were gone. But the fire department and everybody was trying to keep us out of the way. So we just stood there and watched. And I, I remember looking at my husband and saying, why are we waiting? Why are we staying? What are we doing? But, but the house belongs to my husband. This is a second marriage for both of us. It's his house. And he said, well, this is my house. I want to protect it. This is my house. I want to stay with it. And I said, OK, but we need to have a way out. We started getting phone calls from well, friends, you know, friends who, who are worried. And, and so, you know, we go outside. I, I looked around. You, you couldn't smell smoke. You couldn't see fire. The wind was rushing down the canyon. As a homeowner, I understand the urge to stay by your home and to save your possessions and the strong desire to make a stand. Unfortunately, for us to save a structure, it depends on so many things. And we had the proper tools and the gear to make that stand. But for people doing it themselves, they're generally relying on garden hoses and a water supply that's suspect to begin with. Everybody has seen the videos, you know, of the guy on the roof of his house with the garden hose and the small stream that's being blown onto his neighbor's property. At best, it's a futile attempt and not worth the risk. And we wanted to get in and get set up and do our thing. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> they really, some of the law enforcement did not want us there. But we have, by law, a certain range we can cover. And there's a California Penal Code 49.5 subsection D that allows me to go into areas that are cordoned off as long as it's not a crime scene. We have cops <laughs> that in the van and can display it. You don't want to push those buttons. You don't want to have a catastrophe and have a fight with the law enforcement people. So we work with them. With the wind blowing and the embers, it's actually all coming at you horizontally. If you don't have proper breathing protection and goggles and are covered in all the fire protective gear that we have, you will get burned, uh, even a little ember down your coat or in your hair. So I kept trying different ways in, Ashley Road and Sycamore Canyon and uh, you know whatever, and honestly there's a fairly reasonable chunk of time where I don't know where I was or what I was doing. <laughs> I was in my car and I was driving, but beyond that I was a little frantic and I kept thinking, I've got to get back to the house. I've got to get back. It was probably about an hour and a half, maybe two hours after our initial dispatch on the fire. But we were assigned at the top of Los Alturas, and the fire had spotted over the tip of Sycamore Canyon, and it started burning homes on the Riviera. And the concern was that the fire would run down the whole front of the Riviera. And there weren't a lot of resources, resources meaning fire engines and personnel, to make the stop. 
And our friends kept calling. And calling and calling. And one of our friends lived on Butterfly and said, it's headed towards you. I think you ought to think about getting out. My cameraman said, I'm going in to shoot this. And he knew he needed to get over to the Westmont campus and run around. So he finally comes out and he says, oh my god. Buildings are on fire. Dorms are on fire. There's fire everywhere. we got to get out of here. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'm out here. What am I doing? I'm not reporting on anything, but I'm standing there freaking out because i got to take charge of this van. I mean, I don't have the camera, the microphone. When my dad and I got home, we just turned on the TV. They were shouting at news and warnings about evacuation notices and stuff like that. I was eating cereal and just watching the news. And, oh. and um, I was making dinner. And um, Maureen was on the computer. And, and my little story is, I was making a shrimp po' boy sandwich. And I didn't remember. Of course I remember. <laughs> and I, I called my son at some point, then, or close to then. There's somewhere where I remember seeing this huge wall of flame. And I, I cannot even tell you where I was. I don't know what road I was even on. But I remember looking up and seeing this wall of flame and thinking, oh, I should probably go. It was very close. I mean, you could see the flames shooting up very, very close. They came from the bottom and sort of turned around. They'd already been to the monastery, came down, and then up from Gibraltar. That's why it only hit that side of the road. Very close. And it was sort of like, what? Where is it? How far is it? What's the deal? But what was traumatic was it was smoking heavily. It was ashing us heavily. So I called my son, who lives down in Ventura. He didn't even know where my new place was yet, where I had just moved to yet. So I'm babbling to him, saying, Justin, there's a fire. I can't get to the house, and yada, yada, yada. And he's like, can you get on another road? He's listening to what I'm saying and how I'm thinking, and he hasn't even heard about the fire yet. Finally, I said, but maybe I shouldn't go because the firemen said that I could die and it's very hot and there are ashes flying everywhere. And all of a sudden he said, Mom, where are you? What are you doing? What are you talking about? What street are you on? And the wind was so terrible that I could not I had to use both hands to hold on to the door, because um, I went to put a hose up on the roof. Firemen just laughed. Nothing. You know, it went immediately. So it was the wind that did it. It was atrocious. It was awful. And a friend of mine, well, ours. Steve Mead. Oh, he worked in radio for a hundred years. And he was over at the Montecito Fire Station, and which is about three minutes from our house, say. Yeah. And he called and he said, Mo, get out. And I said, What do you mean? I mean there's nothing. And he said, Mo, I'm over at the Montecito Fire Station. Get out. And I said, Listen, I'd smell it if there was anything there. No. Everything I lost was replaceable, except my birth certificate, because they had some law in New Jersey where you had to do it in a certain way, but I uh, had my passport. So uh, we lit a couple of candles and put a little, uh, put a couple of things into the car because somebody told us just to do it. Uh, I put out my immigration papers. Passport. A passport. And we went out and, and you couldn't see. Uh, Parma Park is just behind, uh, in front of us. Uh, and you could just see a little glow. Because he knew. Steve Mead knew. I'm, I'm sort of hard to convince. I was trying to find the most valuable stuff, thinking, well, maybe I should just go. But no, I have to save this. But, ah! <laughs> because there did seem to be some time, right? And my partner, Daniela, was there. So we were both, OK, get the cat. Cat is the most important. And then it was computer files, photos, picture stuff, and documents. OK. We've got all this. Let's just stick it in the car and go. From there, it was just a night of hell. You know, waiting up on the hill at Bill and Steve's house, where I was renting the guest house from. Had this prime view of the world. Eucalyptus Hill goes up, just like that. Eucalyptus Street, boom, just like that. 14 houses, one throw going up, and everybody else is like, wow, incredible. 
incredible. And I'm just shaking in my boots. My son says, okay, which direction are you facing? And I said, um, this direction. And he says, all right, can you turn your car around? And I said, yes, I can turn my car around. And he says, okay, do that. Don't hang up, but turn the car around. So I turn the car around. And he says, all right, now I want you to head straight to the freeway, and I want you to come here to me. <laughs> it makes me tear up. It was such a moment because he got really calm because he knew, he realized that I was way out there. And I said, come to you. And he said, yes, mom, come right here to me. And I said, leave Santa Barbara. And he said, yes, I want you to leave Santa Barbara and come down here and I'm going to take care of you. And people were calling us saying, well, where are you? Are you out? And we, we had people walking through our property and up our street to get out. Most of the neighborhood left. And my family was calling, saying, well, what's going on? What? Why are you still there? Why don't you leave? Why don't you leave? And it was amazingly difficult to do. I actually had to stop over by the freeway on-ramp and stand and watch for a while. We had a strike team of horse trailers and personnel, and the first call that we had actually during that fire was to go up on Mountain Drive. There was a horse that was loose. I went inside the house and started looking for things. And up until this time, I'd been lucky. But now I get unlucky. Because my daughter kept journals since she could write, like six years old. Now she's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. So she'd been keeping them for years. And, uh, I couldn't find them. It's like, well, you don't look for your daughter's diaries? Well, she would hidden them and I didn't have a clue where they were. So I spent some time looking for them because of all the things we own, I thought, well, these are just a treasure. <laughs> and I never could find them. Daniela finished packing her car and left. I had my car totally packed, all my instruments, slippery cases, parked on an incline. I'm ready to go. I have the cat. I can barely see. The sheriff was there, wondering whether or not I was even someone looting, because I was still there, and no one else in the canyon was. And I don't even know why I was there that long. My advice to anybody is to make a list and put it right by your door so you don't take out 10 t-shirts and no underwear, <laughs> which is what I did. <laughs> you laugh, but you know, I kept thinking, I'm going to stay a while, so I'm going to need sweats and t-shirts. So I just took that and a skirt for the next day of teaching and no shoes. Luckily, I had a pair in the car and a pair on. So I'm going to say it took Steve three minutes to drive from the fire station over our bridge. And from there, we had about four or five minutes to to throw the dogs in the car, throw in anything we could find. The Marine's hard drive. Oh, my hard drive. Anything we could find, which was very little. Very and, little. And then Steve backed off the bridge, and Shawnee backed off the bridge, and I pulled my car out of the garage and backed off the bridge, and just as I did, Ambers it slipped around. over Parma Park, and I watched it rush down. A few weeks before, my wife had done some scrapbooking and taking all those old photographs out of shoeboxes and began putting them into scrapbooks. And I knew where the leftovers were, but I didn't know where she put the scrapbooks. So I'm running around the house trying to find the scrapbooks that she had so carefully assembled like two weeks before, and I couldn't find them. And I told Bill, look, uh, I was flying my kite, and I started this thing. And his face just went white, and he goes, no shit, you're screwed. I, go, I know, I am. And the embers were falling on the car. We were never evacuated. We, we were never given anything. Because it was such a fire. It was a, a, a fire. It was like a wind fire. It, it wasn't just like some normal, ordinary. There, there was nothing. There was so much smoke. 
I, I couldn't see, I couldn't find my car keys. It was really insane. And if it wasn't for Steve, I doubt we would have, because I'm, I'm, I'm so stubborn, you know. He, he saved our lives, and he owes us that, you know. And he's in our debt forever. <laughs> oh, I bought him some cigars in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we got the go-ahead to go up there, so we got to the bottom of the hill, and the fire personnel set us up on Mountain Drive. And it was blowing. There was fire everywhere. Jeff Morehouse was driving, and I was the assistant. And we finally found where they had the horse. The firefighters had tied him up to this gate at this house. So I got a halter. And I mean, it was burning. There was smoke everywhere. I looked around at things, and I thought, OK, empty out the legal files. Get your insurance policy. Get your copies of the wills. Get all the, get all the mortgage data and the financial files. And I was dumping them on the floor, and I thought, wait a minute. And I got a uh, recycle bin from outside, and, and I started dumping all the papers into an empty trash can. Quickly filled that up with the reject pictures, but not the real ones. Got all that stuff out of the car with the dog. And I locked that stuff in the car uh, with the dog, thank God. What I did happen to save were the teaching books I had that day that I used the next day and a couple times when I subbed after that. But you know, the bulk of everything was gone. And that, and and the paintings, the ones that went that there were no replacement for, that was the hardest. Clothes, papers, everybody kept saying, did you take your papers? I couldn't open my file cabinet if I wanted to because it was such a piece of junk that I couldn't get the drawer open anyway. <laughs> I didn't even think about taking that. And we almost couldn't walk from the house to the driveway because of the wind and the heat, you know? You're, you're, you're sort of walking like, like this, and there were embers flying, and, and I, I had cinched pieces on my clothing by the end of the evening, and we were, you know, what do we do? What do we do? It was the scariest thing. I mean, it was just me, and I didn't know what to think. I didn't know whether people were going to kill me. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if anybody had been hurt or not. I didn't know if anybody had been killed. I, I don't know. It, it, it was bad. And we couldn't get the horse in the trailer. And we have a rule that when people call us out in a real fire situation like that, we're not going to spend more than 10 or 15 minutes trying to get a horse into a trailer because it's a real risky situation. This horse was so amazing. He was so good. So I just made a decision. We were going to take him. So I told Jeff, you're going to follow me. We're going to walk this horse out. So he started following me down Mountain Drive. And it was a real scene. We, trees were falling and embers were flying. I didn't have my mask with me, but we just got out and started walking through all the fire that would blow through and the smoke and the trees that would just catch on fire. And we, you know, had both our vehicles packed with stuff. It's funny what you pack. In retrospect, I think, you know, why did we pack that? Why did we take this? You know, why did we pack these? You know, just floating silly things into the cars and, and this and that. And, clothes and prescriptions that we needed and you know so we were just throwing things into the car and after a while I'm just packing anything I could find and just throwing anything into the car and I didn't take any of my own paintings any of my own artwork my own art supplies none of it I, I thought about that later you know what was that about my emotional state through the whole experience was either typically me to my detriment, either a personality fault or a bad personality trait, or, or being a doctor. But, but my attitude was always, you've got a problem, you've got to solve here, and, and you had best get on with it. And in the meantime, it was an absolute inferno. It was like watching a movie. We kept saying that to each other. This is like watching a movie. And the flames were just flying. And suddenly there would be an explosion, and that would be somebody's house, or a water heater blowing up, or, or something blowing up. And then the wind would just howl, and then all of a sudden there'd be another explosion, and it would just keep moving, and it was surreal. So I think there was a bit of paralysis. It's like, got this whole house full of nice art. Well, not fabulous art, just prints, jewelry, trophies. Wedding book pictures, all those things that we have in our homes. Nice china, pretty crystal. It's 
It's like, what are you going to take if the whole place is going to go up? We were watching the news and it said everything from, I think everything on Castillo Street was on advisory. So, so I don't know, we put our most viable stuff in a bag and brought it out to the car. And we went outside and we looked at the mountains. And the fire was coming down the hills. I was just hoping that everyone was safe and that nobody got hurt, but that can't always be the outcome of this kind of fire. Do I have to get my son's bike? Do I have to get my daughter's diaries? If I bring any of my geeky stuff, do I have to take my wife's jewelry? It's like, who's going to be mad at me if I don't get what they want out of the house? So it was sort of like, I was kind of paralyzed at that point. I got my phone, my wallet. I, I don't know. I guess not had them enough to get just the basics, some clothes. I would have rather taken all my stuff, but you can't do that. I mean, I want to take my chair and my bed, but that's not going to happen, so. I just stop things in a bag. I kept thinking, I just have to get to my friend's house. And they would save it. And then I'd come back and get my things. And you're thinking, this is really beautiful. But it was horrific. And that was a hard thing to, you know, think about. That was a hard thing to hold. About how amazing this was to be watching this and about how horrifying it was to watch and how dangerous because we were also in a position of being in danger but we just kept watching, watching. So while we're going up Los Alturas Road, there's a variety pack of things going on. Uh, some homes are burning, some homes aren't. The canyon's steep, you can't see. And two significant things happen. One is a strike team comes up from Oxnard and we were pulling over and they were coming at us. And they just basically stopped. And the whole road, basically five or six hours. And I got out and I was just kind of checking out these little long driveways to see which ones are going to be vantage points and which ones look over Sycamore Canyon where we can see the whole bowl and everything. And then the chief comes over to me and he brings his guys over and he goes, are you from around here? And I go, yeah, I'm with Channel 3 News and I work here and I know these streets. And he goes, good. How do we get out of here? Because he wanted to know an escape route. When we got there, one of our major concerns is that there's a good water source. And there are a couple of stories about us going into homes and putting out fires that had already started inside the house. And we did some good, and it felt good to be there and to do that. And we were there because we had a good water source, and the fire hydrants, they still had water. For those areas that didn't have hydrants, they didn't do so well. We had a pool, and we stood up on top of the pool house and said, well, if worse comes to worse, we can jump in the pool and wait for it to pass over us. So we thought about that. But my husband just really didn't want to leave. He said, well, if you want to go, you're not going to be able to come back in. I said, well, I'll wait with you. I'll wait. I'm not the... We'll just see. We'll just wait and see what happens. And so we just stood there all night and watched. We had our hose out. We didn't want, but we did water some things down, but we also knew that water pressure was an issue. And if everyone was watering, that the pressure would go down for the fire trucks. And there were fire trucks everywhere. And there were sirens all night. Trucks all night. And we were just up all night, just watching, watching. Around 10 o'clock at night, we got down a long driveway, which was safe. There was a house under construction, no landscaping. Pretty cool, great, we got a safe zone. The fire could come up here and just hit dirt and it won't burn us up. And we ran a lot of cable down there. And we had a good vantage point just above us of this two-story cliff home that was on fire. And we went live. And it was rather spectacular because it was boiling up and it was illustrating where the fire was spreading and I'm getting the streets and where I'm at and everything. But then a gas line that goes up to a barbecue up there on the second story broke. And I'd never seen this happen where it broke right in front of me and had this raging torch of flames which then took the second story out like that. Because now you have not only the regular fire itself, now you have a torch. And that course was unbelievable. It got pretty hectic at one point, so I just told him, I said, come on, we're going to jog. And I started running. And he just jogged right beside me. He just jogged right through the worst part where it was really smoky and fiery. And we got him down by the fire station there in Montecito. And then I saw KUIT, so I just took him right over and said, I don't know whose horse this is, but we found him. And you need to come to Earl Warren Showgrounds to pick him up. While we're doing this, we're not paying any attention over here. And this is Sycamore Canyon, and a fire over there burning through the bowl. 
And while we're live on the air, this fire starts burning up the hill rapidly. It takes all these oak trees next to us and just Everything was full of fire, live on the air. And I said, oh my gosh, these trees are catching on fire. And they start showering us with embers, live on TV as we're backing up, entangled in the cable, and the camera's all cattywampus to the world. And the anchors are saying, you got to get out of there. And I look to my cameraman, and he goes, we got to get back up and all this. And they're saying, John, you've got to get out of it. And they just basically took the shot back to the TV station, cut us off so that we could get out. And then I, I was getting out of breath, and my brain was starting to not think correctly. I could, I could feel that because I couldn't find my car keys. And this was the ultimate trauma of my life in certain ways, because it was like my mind was going, God, are you serious? Is this really how I'm going to go? Tell me this isn't happening. This can't be possible. Where are my freaking keys? You know? So I'm going up and down the pathway trying to find my keys. It's getting dark. My glasses were useless. The soot and the smoke were in my eyes. I could not see. We could tell where things were. Oh, that's Westmont. Oh, gosh, that looks like part of Kerwood Hall going up. See the houses in their housing area there go up. And I kept thinking about the images of 19th century paintings of Pompeii blowing up. With clouds of smoke and lava and fire and flame and people fleeing and how the painters would romanticize it as the idea of the sublime, beauty and horror together. And I kept thinking about how overwhelming the elements are, how we're just so small and feeble and unprotected against it all. I looked around and I thought, well, maybe it won't burn down. I sort of hopped in the car and everybody said, where are you going? And I said, I'm getting out of here and I think you should too because this is, this is not good. By then it was smokier and you could see the flames. And my keys are, are not on the pathway, they're not in the house. Uh, they must be in the car when I was loading, they must have fallen out of my hand. But my car was packed. So I, I went around back and I opened the door, lifted the hatchback, and everything fell back onto me because I was parked on an incline. So then I, I, I whacked my shoulder trying to catch my two guitars and sitar that fell on top of me as I lifted the hatchback. That knocked me on my butt. There was stuff everywhere. I couldn't find my keys even then. I was really starting to freak out. Now, oh, normally I don't freak out. I've been in three wars and been evacuated out of all of them and I'm pretty immune to most stuff. But this, this was totally freaky. My lights were on in the house. So I get my car and I drive down to my friend's house. She lives on the Mesa. And I'm halfway down and it's pitch black. Her lights were on. So I'm thinking, what's the point of me being down here? My lights were on. She has candlelight, but and then I'm starting to think, well, well, what if my car doesn't start because there's not enough oxygen? Or what if my tires, which unlike fire engines, don't have nitrogen in their tires, I don't want to get a lead sled, as they call it. When a burnover happens, whether you're on foot or you're in the engine sometimes, and you were trying to get out, and the decision was made too late, there's not enough oxygen for the engine to operate properly. They'll lose power on the way out. Firefighters have lost their lives as a result of delayed decisions. The trauma makes it hard to remember, but fire was coming over the hill, and I could see it. It was very scary, like, like a tsunami of light. But I don't have my keys, and, and my cell phone's not working, or it's just not working now. I can't make calls out. My husband was very adamant about staying. There's barely enough oxygen at that point. It was really getting pretty intense. So then I thought, okay. They must be in the back seat. So, so then I fish around and <laughs> the happiest moment of, of my life was grabbing my car keys. If we leave, we'll never get back in. We, they won't let us back in. But then my secondary thought was, you're still not out of the woods, dude. So then I had to put everything back in the car. I had the choice. I, I could have just run over the stuff and pulled out, but it was like, okay, 
this is everything I have, so I'll just put it in. So I did, and then I got in the car, and it was like, here's the test. First test, my car started. <laughs> Thank God, right? Second test, I'm rolling backwards out of the spot. No, let's let, we're out of here. And then it was like, third test. What if there's a backlog getting out of the canyon? I got down the hill, and there was the worst traffic jam you ever saw. And the fire was coming down the hill a lot faster than the cars were moving. And by that time, there was nobody running the sheriff's blockade like I had, so there were, there were two lanes going in the same direction, downhill towards Foothill, Cathedral Oaks, and we weren't moving. And there were horses and trailers and being led down the hill. That, that was the only time that I was I was really afraid. I was, I was scared, like pretty damn scared. There was, I mean, there were cars, there were horses, just backed right up, so But I then the traffic there. jam opened up. There was a sheriff's officer at the bottom of the hill directing traffic, and he got us out of there. He, he got everybody out of fact. So I'm sitting there at the bottom feeling like, oh, I'm over the complete freakout. But then this was sort of the secondary thought from what I understand. These fires can move unbelievably fast. And you're toast. Then we sat there and heard the reports coming back. Within an hour, it was clear that the fire had come down there was a map inside the command center. We could see where the edge of the fire was. Every 15 or 20 minutes, they'd update it on this blackboard. It was like watching hell. We just kept watching, watching. So I can't get out. I could just grab the cat and run over the hill, but it is so smoky, I would probably be trapped. I just pulled over to the side of the road and got really angry and yelled obscenities at that fire. It was clear. I was going to be very lucky if my house escaped. And we made it. We stuck it out. We stayed all night. And eventually, the log jam was funneling enough to where I got out. We didn't leave the house until maybe three or four days after the fire was gone. And then I drove down to my son's house in Ventura. Stayed there till Sunday. Would have been a miracle if my house survived. Of course it didn't. An RTV station is on in the command center. We're on the flat screen TV. We're in the emergency rooms. They're watching what Channel 3 is showing and matching it up with their commanders and their maps. But they don't have the imagery that we're providing. That kind of verifies what's going on. It's kind of funny. Uh, I got into a, a bit of an argument with one of the newer firefighters, which was very inappropriate, actually, because on the fire ground, it's sort of like a military operation. So rank has its place. And sometimes you do what you're told, and you just don't question it. We had backed down to this hydrant to make a stand. And all the trees around us, they went up in flames. And so we backed away from that. And one of the newer firefighters, he comes to me and he says, we can't stay here. I said, we are going to stay here. We're going to back up a bit, actually. We're going to let the bulk of the fire move through these trees, and then we're going to come back in, and we're going to do what we can to save this structure. And he looks at me with his three to five years of experience versus my 25 years of experience, and he says, we can't save this structure. And I looked at him and I said, we are going to save this structure, but we are not going to get hurt while doing it. And ultimately, there was a picture of that house in the paper with a sign on the front of it, a big handmade sign that said, we don't know how you did it, but thank you for saving our home. And that was a victory. And I cut that picture out. And I put it on my locker at work. Uh, this fire started at 7.30 in the evening, and by 4 in the morning it was out. It, it wasn't that big of a fire, but it burned down almost 200 houses from Sycamore Canyon right up to Los Alturas. 
Painted Cave fire burned up 550 holes. Went from up by Painted Cave down into Hope Ranch in the space of two and a half to three hours. It crossed, and, and you talk about fire breaks. You think, well, why didn't somebody cut a line? Why didn't the Army come and do backfires? Well, well this fire crossed a frontage road, a six-lane highway, a railroad right away, and another frontage road when they were all empty. Got into Hope Ranch across Kyrie Owl, 101. Union Pacific Tracks in Hollister Avenue. Gives you the idea that there was, there was nothing stopping this fire. I went with my son and my daughter. And the strange thing about it was, until you got up on the road, it looked like nothing had happened. The next morning we drove up to the fire area and had to stop and walk up to the house. It was another warm day, and it was stinky, awful. It smelled like smoke, just burnt plastic. It was very dusty and windy. Yeah. They said, OK, you can go home now. It's all right. It's fine. So again, we, well, I tried to go back up. They wouldn't let us in. So then I got my friend Steve again, who got us out, because he has a press pass. And so Steve and I went back up. So we went on Sunday. They were saying that nobody was allowed in, but I was a little bit desperate at that point. And I kept thinking, maybe because it's this adobe house with great thick walls and a red tile roof, and I thought, if any house can survive, why not this one, right? We walked on up to the house. All the houses along the way were burned. We walked up to the house, and the the clunker car looked like the car out of a war scene. The tires were burned. The gas tank had either burned or exploded. The, the rear door it was charred and rusted. It looked like 100 years old. The chimneys on the house were both standing. They were made out of brick. We were just big. Every pump, plumbing outlet had a, had a vent pipe to the roof. And all the vent pipes had a little flashing to keep them from leaking. And, and there was nothing left of the house but all these vent pipes sticking up with the flashing. It looked like little umbrellas. I looked at that. It's very bizarre. I mean, who knows what a dead house looks like? Well, this was a dead house. So we were driving, and my son says, Mom, where did you live? Where is the house? And we came around the bend, and I said, Oh my gosh, stop the truck. We're here. And my son says, here, where? Because there wasn't a structure in sight. So we park and we go in, and it was pretty devastating. It's like going into a war zone. There's nothing recognizable, just heaps of dirt. You wouldn't even recognize that the walls had ever existed. Yeah, it is bizarre. Oh. And then the monastery, of course. I couldn't even go up there. I just couldn't bear it. After the fact, they'll say that one of the things that kept coming to mind was that the house survived the fire, but our marriage didn't. My husband was was really happy and very proud of himself for not leaving and sticking it out and taking care of that. And I had a little bit of a sinking feeling. And I, I couldn't identify it for a long time. It took me several weeks of, of taking in what was destroyed and, and talking to people about how much they had lost and what a loss it was and how they would start over or how they would rebuild or how awful it was. And I think it took a while for me to realize that I even thought that. That I even had those thoughts about if the house had gone. I almost wish we could have had the chance to go back into the same kinds of issues, the same kinds of feelings, and the same inequality that I felt, and the same what's important and what's not kind of feeling. Well, for that to sink in, and by the time the end of the year rolled around, I really started to feel that I, I 
couldn't stay in that environment that I became too sad for me. And that's when I started thinking. I almost I hate to say this, but I almost wish the house had gone for the chance to try to rebuild something together. You know, bring something together that was both of ours. After the fire, I went down to the police station. They wanted to put me in protective custody because, well, people were pretty pissed off. And uh, as this is happening, the police department is also having me go down and take a lie detector test to make sure that I'm telling the truth that I started this thing. In this circumstance, it was all of my possessions and all of the aspects of my life that those possessions represented. So I'm about five minutes into crying and weeping and moaning and groaning and all of it. And I had been working for probably the last year and a half prior to the fire in this belief and premise that we can change our brain patterns. We can change the conditioning in our brains. I had taken this on as a daily practice that I was retraining my mind to dwell within a place of happiness regardless. But at this moment, I'm still crying and feeling rather sorry for myself. And I decided that I would make a deal. Uh, the rest of the story, the, the shrimp sandwich, I always still think about it and talk about it because it's a good anecdote in a way. I, I had made the shrimp sandwich and was ready to eat. Uh, the electricity went out, uh, and we lit some candles, and Stephen came, and we got out. And to this day, I don't know why I never took that sandwich with me. <laughs> because I was hungry. I, it was my, my dinner, and I starved that night. Uh, we didn't have anything to eat, and that was all I could think of. Was, I wonder if my shrimp sandwich would be okay when I get back. <laughs> and, uh, of course, uh, but uh, that's what it was, uh, and there's a shrimp sandwich sitting there, you know, waiting for me, and I just kept thinking, you know, I should have brought that sandwich with me, you know. <laughs> One of the problems is that we reacted in different ways. I was walking around saying, wow, look at that, look at that. My wife was in tears, so we weren't reacting the same way at all. I was standing on the side of what used to be the garage, and my son, bless his heart, for his 16th birthday, he didn't want a car. He wanted a very expensive aluminum bicycle called the Cannondale. So we had just purchased that about three months ago. On the floor of the garage was this blob of aluminum with spokes, with stainless steel spokes sticking out of it. it looked like a piece of modern sculpture. And that was his bicycle. And that was the first time I started to lose it emotionally, and I began to tear up. I'll tear up now because my son came over and he put his arms around me and he said, Dad, it's just stuff. Out of the mouths of babes. I mean, how does a 16-year-old know that and a 45-year-old not? So proud that that would be his reaction. So moved by the fact that he'd already understood the essence of it. We're okay. You got Pepper out, the dog. We got a bunch of dead stuff, but we're all okay. We're going to be okay. After the fire, I went to Oregon, and I felt terrible. I near shot myself up there. Fortunately, I was drinking then. I got drunk a lot to make me forget, and it's probably what saved my life, and also turned me into a pretty serious drinker. But between the time of the fire and throughout the trial, which lasted seven years, I just kept getting papers. There, there was this big class action suit, and my co-defendant was Edison. So I was right in the main loop of everything. But I got a bunch of letters from a bunch of people I didn't know that felt badly for me. I still have them down in the hangar with all the other papers and stuff. Well, here's how we thought about it, and how we still think about it. We think of ourselves as survivors rather than victims. And the way we thought about it was we could have went to the movies and our dogs would have been dead. And, and, and they're our life, you know. 
I'm going to cry. I wouldn't have left without the dog. My van, my van, my minivan, which is my doggy van. They were in there. It, it could have stalled on the bridge. It, it, it could have stalled. Say that, say the battery died or something could have happened. And uh, Maureen wouldn't have been able to get her car out. Uh, and there was no getting away from that fire the way it came down. So, mm, oddly enough, the only thing. So those are the things that we think about. Uh, and we think to ourselves, we were lucky. <laughs> and we were lucky people. One thing is, I could just cut it loose and say it's just stuff. It's just stuff. We don't need it. We can walk away from this. It's just stuff. But for my husband, it meant more. It was not just stuff. It was his place on this earth. I understood that really clearly. Maybe because it wasn't mine to begin with. That's a possibility. Probably the truth. Really, it wasn't mine to begin with, so I could cut it loose. Well, of course, I felt terrible. I mean, you, you just, you do. Unless you're out there intentionally starting fires, nobody wants this to happen. I will say, I'm more at ease with it now, after the tea fire. After I lost my own house. I can tell you that we're divorced now. That's about all I can tell you. But I can also tell you that we reacted to the fire in completely different ways. I think it's safe to say that our lives began to diverge pretty dramatically at that point. Our lives were, they were no longer on parallel tracks. They diverged. That's about all I feel comfortable telling you. But I can also tell you that having been in medicine for a long time, that, that when bad things happen inside of a family, that the divorce rate is incredibly high because people grieve differently. I mean, if one person is very emotional and the other person isn't, if one person is angry and the other person is taking this with equanimity, friction and anger occur. That, uh, that is a universal phenomenon when bad things happen inside of a room, a family. And I said, look, God, I know, generally speaking, that you don't do deals, but man, I really need a little help right now. This is tough. This is the toughest thing I think I've ever had to deal with. I really appreciate it, and I would be so grateful if you could throw me a bone on this one. I want to find this one piece, and it's a jewel. It's kunzite, a large kunzite that had been part of a necklace that I had worn through pretty much every spiritual initiation that I had been in. And, and here's my part back. If I find this piece, I will walk away from this knowing that all this was not just some pointless, random, horrible thing. It has purpose, and it has meaning, and it's up to me to uncover that purpose and that meaning, and I commit that I will do that. I will focus on positive outcomes from this, but I want my gift first. <laughs> my daughter sent me a Christmas card with a drawing that she had done of a firebird. My dad is Russian, and that firebird is a story in Russian mythology of, of coming out of the ashes. It's like a phoenix. The universal symbol, it has that same quality that one can rise up out of whatever ashes we have, whether they are created for us, or whether we create them, or whatever the circumstances are. It's a wonderful image of being able to rise up to something new, beautiful, and not just survive, but to almost have a rebirth, something beautiful and it is powerful and gave me a lot of hope. So now I get lucky again because I have a friend I can have a cup of coffee with in the cottage cafeteria. Say this really sucks, but you know he's a he's an oncologist so he understands. And I've been through enough end of life experiences with my patients so that when you put it in perspective Losing a house is pretty high up on the totem pole. It's not at the top. It's just, uh, <laughs> it builds character. 
I don't know. Uh, it, it's one of the main things in my life. You know how people go through certain doors in their life. Well, this is one of the things that changed my life. This is one of them. Just about as much what any life can handle. But uh, I'm at peace with it now. So I'm holding this vision in my mind's eye. I'm determined to find this peace. So I started calling it, which I know sounds a little odd, but I'm a mom. And it's kind of like calling a young child. I'm saying, you need to come to mama right now. <laughs> and I'm saying this all out loud. I'm speaking out loud. It's very important that this happen right now. It's important to me, and I need for you to just, just appear. I remember I actually texted somebody and said, my cottage is toast. But I feel curiously liberated. And that kind of sums it up. It was like, you make a big sacrifice, but it gets better. And somehow, what the universe gives in return is better. And I'm digging through little bits, and it was just such a slow process. And sure enough, it did. <laughs> it just popped out of the ash. Perfect. No soot, no setting around it. The gold setting had melted away. But there's this stone. It's about this big, cut in a pear shape, brilliantly faceted, and it just looked stunningly radiant coming out of this gray ash. And I just howled. I was just hooting and hollering, yes, yes. And then all of a sudden, all these people who I had no idea were around me. I guess you know sound carries, and people heard me hooting, and they recognized that I found something of value, and they all started cheering and clapping. <laughs> I couldn't see one of them, but all these voices all around me, all these people, were just cheering and clapping and hooping along with me. <laughs> yeah, and no. When I sit in our living room, I look at Shani and this is it. This is where I need to be. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't have the same sort of feel of it I do. Oh. There are some things, like Patty's finish. We, we had this stone bitch right out our front door and my sister-in-law who I loved, had died a few years earlier of cancer. They lived in Oregon. And before when she would come down and uh, visit in California before she got really ill. And with her prescription marijuana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> out the window. And the bench was still there. It made it. Shawnee had written a beautiful poem. All gone. <laughs> There's a stone bench at my front door. And it shall never go unoccupied anymore. Because when I see her sit and stare. Oh no, she's not alone out there. Was that it? Yeah. That was it. Was it really? I didn't think it rhymed that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. Anyway, that's a good story. <laughs> 